Marion was affirming that the growth of the number of simple closed pairs on a hyperbolic surface, S, um, grows polynomially in L, where the <coughs> the exponent is 6g minus 6 plus 2n, right? So this is also sort of like this lattice can kind of result, because what is 6g minus 6? That's just the dimension of the set of uh, measure laminations, right, or of type one space. And so you're sort of looking at, you know, and what is a simple closed curve or a simple closed multi-curve? It's sort of a integral lattice point set of measure laminations. And so somehow this is this growth rate is also related to like a sort of tangential theme. Okay. Um, S is a genus G services and function. I think I should put that up already. That's the gene N. Okay, and then uh, we also know for K equals one, you get the same uh, there's the same data and you get the same sort of S and like same growth rate with a different constant depending on what you S. Okay. So that's kind of it. So now we have coarse bounds. <coughs> Sorry. Right, so for an arbitrary function, we don't, th this is it, this is all we know. Let's see what sort of coarse bounds we can get. Um, right, the question is, let's fix L and K, what's the best we can do? Okay, so there's the trivial thing, right? Simple closed curves fit the ones with most, uh, most case of intersections. And to all of them, okay, great. But that, that, I mean, that's not very good, right? Because on the one side we have polynomial growth, on the other side we have exponential growth. Let's try and do a little bit better. So for k fixed, um, there, we can use this theorem of a three of the Eskin Rizakani that talks about lattice points in particular space, right? So if you have, you know, some this is particular space, and we have some metric x, right, the mapping class group x on x, and we have these lattice points, right, and this theorem talks about the, um, the growth of the number of lattice points in a ball radius r. Sort of like an analog, actually it's an analog of this, of this theorem here, of, like, for a surface, but in particular space, and you can sort of translate that using work of Bosnian and others into counting these um, you get that <coughs> the number of curves, if you fix k, is roughly equal to, so up, up to some constant multiple, uh, to this polynomial growth times f of k, where f of k is the number of mapping class group orbits in GCLK. And the thing to notice that even if we just look at all geodesics, no restriction on length, but with the most k-self intersections on a surface, there are finitely many up to mapping class group action. Right? So for simple closed geodesics, you can see this, you just cut along your simple closed curve, and you just get some topological type, right? <coughs> and, and it's similar with k intersections. It's like some sort of, the curve uses sort of uh, balance for a graph, and you, you can see that there are finitely many of these orbits. Anything about that function? No. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the thing. So we don't actually know. Uh, yeah. So, so figuring out the dependence on k is sort of what I'm trying to. Uh, Wait, but, but I don't understand. Why is it uniformly bound? Why, why is it bounded independent of L? Um. So the uh, three of. <coughs> only sound like I'm dying. That actually. Dying. So. The yeah, three of the SMS kind of paper gives you asymptotic growth in particular space. And then the constants you get from translating from particular space to uh, to the surface are, are uniform. So you just look at the growth of one, like in one orbit. Let's get that. Okay. Oh wait, were you asking about um, why F of K doesn't depend on L? Yeah. Oh, um, because you just, you're looking at the topological type of these valence four graphs on a surface. Well, that's a topological function, right? There's, yeah. there's no length there. Right? Exactly. Yeah, the number of modulo orbits of curves that intersect. At most of the time. No, there's no L in the definition of that. Okay. No. Right, right. Yeah. 
And yeah, the other point is just it's some topological type, and there are only so many ways of embedding a balance for graphic K vertices onto the surface. Okay. Right. Like I said, case by F in general is it's not known. Okay, so what have we got? For an arbitrary K, we have growth like exponential, right? And for polynomial, uh, for K fix, we have this polynomial growth that we expect, right? So the problem is sort of to interpolate between these two things. You know, there have to be some functions that go between polynomial and exponential. Okay, so before we can do that, we have to sort of talk about you know the usual dependence between like the intersection numbers. So what should should this function um, what, what what should this dependence be? So a theorem of Wiley says if you choose a sequence of closed geodesics and that was L at random they'll grow asymptotically like L squared, where the constant kappa depends only on the geometry, only on the metric on your surface. And then the theorem of Vesnagian that the L squared is basically the most self intersections you can get. Right? And, and there's a nice critique for that. Right, you look sort of locally on your surface, the curve, you know, cuts like a bunch of little arcs on this little local picture. And you know, cap n arcs are at most n squared uh, intersections. So the, the, the trick is to make sure you don't have too many short arcs. So the number of like sticks, whatever, um, actually is a good representation of length. Wait, sir, what, is, what does that mean depends on the geometry of the surface? So for every, uh, it's just the metric. It's just capital, it's, it's a function. It's a function of the metric. Yes. Yeah. The yes, that's exactly right. Right, because I mean, I guess you have lots of, if you have like a really short curve on your uh, surface, then you might get lots of intersections for, for very short, small length. So it's, it's not uniform. Yeah. So the moral of this is that your intersection number is like usually like length squared, and it's usually maximal. Right, it's all squared is, is maximal. <coughs> right, so the idea is you want to bound the size of GCLK for arbitrary L and K. And I'm just going to give you an idea for how you might do this for an arbitrary surface S. Um, and I'll sort of show an explicit bound for a pair of pants and show how to do it. Okay, so. So the idea is we want to go from counting on arbitrary surface to counting on present pants. And here's why. Basically, there's infinitely many simple closed curves on an arbitrary surface. You can see the curves just sort of follow along and they trace out these simple closed curves as they go along the surface, right? And you can really see this on a pair of pants. It's just what does it do? It just winds and winds and winds. So you have infinitely many closed curves, simple closed curves on an arbitrary surface, and there's just three on a pair of pants. So we like present Right. So how we should do this? So we want to reduce the curves again. So let's say we have some geodesic gamma on some surface. So we're going to choose a starting point, and we're going to follow it around until we make a figure eight. Right. And I chose the starting point sort of carefully that there is no tail or whatever. And the nice thing this this figure eight lives in a unique pair of pants. Right. It's, you take the neighborhood. Okay, so we have one of these guys, and now we need a sequence that we can all we can glue together to get that gamma. So we choose our next starting point so that when we go, it's going to overlap with the previous curve. We get a new figure A. Okay, and then we get a new pair of pants, and we just keep going. Right, so now we have a way of extending this process. So this is a bit of a lie. So this, this method doesn't quite work with the idea of finding you know, these pairs of pants or these simple closed curves that the geodesic traces out that we can then put back together to make the original geodesic, that's sort of the, that, that's the main point of this, right? Um, so how do we count this? We count the sequence of pairs of pants or a sequence of like simple closed curves, whatever it is. And then we count geodesics on an arbitrary pair of pants. Okay. So this is an idea of how you might approach <coughs> And so, oops, so we know how to count these, you know, so pairs of pants aren't so hard to count because they're just simple closed multi curves, right? And we know how to count those. And, you know, you, intersection plays into it as well. And then, you know, we want to, okay, so now I'm going to talk about how to count a pair of pants. Right. 
So, there's a person in pairs of pants. It's an open question how many pairs of pants there are like, even as a product of surface, right? Mm -hmm. well, what, what, was your, what was your statement? Uh, so, with respect to length? Yeah. No, because they're just simple multi curves. With respect and so, to length, sorry. Yeah. yeah. But if you have like some sort of set of pairs of pants and you know they intersect at most k times, there's a uh, there's a way to there's a way to count those. So okay, I'm about to state the result. It's kind of messy. So just whenever you see your k, you just squint and think L. <laughs> and then it becomes a lot less messy. So I'm going to fence. Okay, so we get a lower bound that's e to the root k. So that's great. That's like a lower bound abruptly to the L. That's what we expect. An upper bound of this. Um, so What's going on is the idea is that L and K compete for control, right? So the top one happens when uh, K is between L and L squared, right? And the bottom one happens when K is less than L squared. And these constants depend only on the geometry, so on the lengths and the boundaries. And the nice thing is that as the lengths of boundaries go to infinity, these constants go to zero, right? Because if you have really large boundary lengths, it's really hard to close up. It takes a long time. And okay, so reducing this a little bit, if k grows smaller, uh, sl more slowly than L squared, then you already get exponentially fewer geodesics of length k than you do of uh, than you do of all geodesics. Okay. So idea of proof. The idea is we're going to come to parallel. So. From gamma, <coughs> we're going to get a word W of gamma that's in some finite alphabet. And the length intersection uh, number are going to be some sort of properties of this word. As so a counting to the is going to be listing as counting words. Okay, so what do we do? First, we decompose a pair of pants into two right angle hexagons. And then the, we're going to make gamma into a word in the edges. Hexagons. So here's gamma, some sort. We unwrap it, right? So it's like the nearest cover, whatever you want. And the idea is that this point is the same as that point. But promise that actually is true. And then we project. So there's there's some you know some way to project. The, it's like they make sure you do it right. And so now we want a word in the hexagon edges. But so here we go, right? We have these sort of long subwords along the boundary. So B1 is actually a subword. And it has lots of letters. Then we have some short sort of seams. And then B2 actually goes, we can do this here. Right, so, so we get this word in long sequences, boundary edges, and short seams. OK, so what are the properties? So the map is one to one. As you can see, this um, sort of projected curve is really homotopic to the, uh, the geodesic, which gives it the map is one to one, and it's determined by these sort of sequences of boundary letters. Because between any two sort of at least boundary subwords, there is only one way to connect them by a seam. Aren't there two ways of projecting it? In this one, yes. So you just choose one once and for all. In general, for longer words, um, there's definitely some choice, but yeah. So, so there's like a technical property that you want to satisfy to make sure they're not too many. And it's also, it's not so important, right? Because if we overcount to get the upper bound, it's fine. And then when we uh, get the lower bound, we just want to construct some, some words. And then you just, you still need to make sure that you get lots of different things. So one to one is replaced by control number. Um, no, it's, well, the map from gamma's two words is one to one. Because two different gammas give us two different words. Mm. And that's all I care about. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Is, it, is this the same as the writing in the free group? No, um, because the... The VIs are generated, yeah. The, the, it's kind of, but... Okay, so first of all, you use all three boundary components. Right, but that's still a free group where you're writing. No. Free group once you generate yeah, okay. with three boundaries. They're actually... So you want to use 12. Okay. Because you want... Um, right, it matters whether I start... Um, uh, so I divide each boundary component into two points. And it matters whether I start on one or the other. Right? 
Yeah, because going from here to here is different from going to like from here to there. Right. So I only want it, um, I want there to only be one scene that can connect any two uh, boundary things. And so if I have, um, so if I have you know like these two uh, boundary components, and I want to start here and wind up here, right? I either need to go a half word and go down, or I need to have more scenes. Yeah, and so it turns out to be easier to just make everything just dependent on these half. Yeah, so it's similar, but not quite the same. Okay, so I promised that there'd be an analog to length intersection number. Okay, so length is easy, right? You can sort of see that this should be roughly the word length. Um, and this is the only place where constants depend on the geometry of speed. Everything else is purely topological. Okay, and then intersection numbers. So this is where things get tricky and a little bit technical. So I'm just going to give the sort of the cartoon for this. So we have uh, W of gamma is written as these boundary subarcs. For each boundary subword, right, that wraps around some number of half twists around like some pant leg, we assign you know, a piece of gamma that it's going to have the same number of half twists. And roughly speaking, the, if the number of half twists is 2n, then you should get n self-intersections for this piece. And this isn't quite true, like, for n small, but it's true enough. Right? And then, moreover, if you have two guys that overlap, they're going to interfere with one another. Right? If two guys twist around the same boundary component, then you can always arrange them so the guy who twists four lives on top, but then he has to pass through the one on the bottom and give you lots of intersections. Right, so somehow you should get the sort of minimum uh, thing, that if gamma i and gamma j are around the same guy, and you have two n half twists for one and two n for the other, then it's going to be the minimum of those two intersections. OK, and then you can put all this together and get the following thing. So the up and down is kind of what you'd expect from those formulas. <coughs> it's the sum and the lengths, and each each length that's like the smaller lengths intersect, you know, the smaller winding numbers intersect the bigger winding numbers. For the lower bound, it's not quite doesn't quite work um, because you don't always have those those formulas. But you, you get something close enough. Is that like a max or a min or something? Uh, it's a. No, wait, no, it's both, actually. Sorry, it's not, it's neither. It's, um, it's both bounded below by n squared and by the sum. Okay. And these two don't have to, like, you use both of these in, in different, oh, different oh, parts. Yeah, so, so they're both, they're both useful. I mean, I suppose it'd be a yeah, max. max, yeah. I'm sorry, I just haven't. Okay, so we have some restrictions in length intersection number, give us restrictions on words. An upper bound you get from getting up and down on the number of words that satisfy these restrictions. And for lower bound, you just construct words. And yeah, it's all finished this part, just a picture, right? Like, you can, you can see how here we have some sort of complicated thing they mess, and here we have some nice, easy way of just seeing what this mess is doing. Right, just sort of winding around that one. Okay, so how much time do I have? I guess I started at 11, so it's 35. Okay. Um, so now I want to give sort of an application of this thing. Um, so you, you can apply this sort of combinatorial model uh, to this uh, theorem of Berman series um, because it sort, of, it sort of fits sort of into their original proof. So let me state the original theorem. Um, so let G, without a C, be the set of complete geodesics on the surface S. So I'm going to make this sort of complicated definition of K some function of L. So for an, like, at first we're going to just look at K constant. Uh, but K some function of L, let's let G of K be the set of complete geodesics where at every interval of length L, 
you have at most k of l self intersections, right? Um, so okay, so when k is constant, this is just the complete geodesics for most of the self intersections, right? So this is a picture of uh, you know simple complete geodesic. Let's say uh, the reason for this complicated definition is eventually we want to consider uh, you know what happens if you L infinitely many intersections, but maybe you have like lazy geodesics that have not enough of these intersections. Okay. So the original theorem is that, you know, for any set H of uh, geodesics, M H is the points uh, lying on, you know, on your surface and pass the line along these geodesics. So the original theorem is that if K is constant, fixed, then the image of uh, G of K is nowhere dense in Pascal's Right? Sorry, what's G of K? It's the um, set of complete geodesics with the most k self intersections in this case. So think the set of simple complete geodesics in this case. Um, so I'm going to show a picture of this in a minute. So compare this to the fact that if your surface is finite volume, then closed geodesics are dense on your surface. Right? Uh, this, is by, oops, this is by mixing the geodesic flow and like, closing all of them. You approximate any complete geodesic on a closed surface. By, uh, by sequence of closed geodesics. <coughs> so here's a picture on a Sorry. once. Yes. Why are those not contradicting Because GC is all closed geodesics. Yeah, so GK is. So all closed of all intersections. But so all intersections. Right. Yes, not simple. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the thing. We're <laughs> No, you're not doing simple closed curves right now. Yeah, yeah. That's, Okay, so here's a picture for a once function of torus. Um, I think, I don't remember exactly. I still have a paper of uh, user and Collier. And over here we have the first, like, <coughs> sorry, like 100 maybe? Uh, closed geodesics on a once function of torus, and you can see they're sort of going everywhere. And over there we have the first same number of simple closed geodesics. And you can see that one of these very thin sets. Like, the sets intersect with a very thin very thin across the cross section of section Okay, um, so the question is, let's interpolate, right? For what functions um, K of L, <coughs> you know, do complete geodesics with, you know, K of L self-intersections on intervals of length L also line these thin sets, you know, where is it no redundancy? Also dimension one, or maybe like also dimension smaller than than it's supposed to be. Okay. So just to be clear, these guys these aren't closed sets, right? These are. No, you take the closure. Oh, you take the closure. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the reason I was uh, the reason I'm looking at closed geodesics here is just because you know even with closed you can approximate complete ones with closed geodesics, and you can already see that they're like they're being dense. Right, but I mean, okay. So a set of complete geodesics on a closed surface is everything. So that's that's not, you know, that's not as interesting as a picture. Okay. But yeah, um, so so you take. Well, yeah, you're you're um, you're looking at. I, I was asking like the image here, like these sets that you're talking about, house house dimension one. There mm. are they're not closed mm -hmm. sets on the surface, right there. Uh, well, they're not. They're not closed sets on the surface. If you look at the guys with length at most L, uh, and most case open intersections, is that set closed? Um, actually, maybe not necessarily, yeah. Yeah. Because they could limit potentially on things with, with a lot more. Oh, I'll ask about that. Okay. So, when can you expect something like this? What functions, you know, should we be looking at? Well, there's this fact that, like, you can get by mixing um, geodesic flows that, asymptotically, if you take some complete geodesic and you look at larger and larger chunks of it, asymptotically you should get L squared uh, self intersections for length L pieces, right? So, oops. so if this image of G of K is maybe small, your function K of L had better be smaller than like, this cap L squared. Okay, so here's the result you can get on a pair of pants. Um, 
if you're on a pair of pants and your self intersection number, self intersection rate, is like epsilon length squared, then there's some function u of epsilon that goes to one as epsilon goes to zero, where the Hausdorff dimension, oh, that should be image of the of the image of g of k is mu of epsilon. And then the other thing is that if your intersection rate is little o of length squared, then you're nowhere dense. And the image of the set is nowhere dense. And the Hausdorff dimension of the image of g of k. Yeah, yeah, I uh, didn't catch that before. But yeah, that is the image of g of k. It approaches one. So the the strange thing here is that you know one you know, you think one sort of grows like constant L squared is like another, but no, in fact, as the constant gets very small, your Hausdorff dimension also decreases. So I found that surprising. Um, so the method we use is basically straight from uh, the original paper, but using a different combinatorial model. Uh, so so the idea is we have this combinatorial model for closed curves. You can also make it for arcs. Right, so here we have some way of combinatorializing arcs. And so here's the picture. When you have two arcs uh, that have the same word, right? Let's say an universal cover, that means they go through the same set of hexagons, right? And so we have these two arcs going through the same set of hexagons which means they follow travel, and so in the middle, they're going to come close together, right? And so for each word, right, that's essentially a pair of hexagons, universal cover, there is some small set of arcs, right? They all live in like this, this set here, right? And you look at like maybe the volume of the set, and then you want to, then the count for the number of words is the number of sets of these small, like thin sets you can have, right? And so if you compare one to the other, this is going way faster than this. Okay, um, you compare, you know, the size of these sets, the number of these arcs, and you get, you know, some sort of bound on a uh, house function, like the density or the volume of the set. Okay, so. Man, we were talking so fast. So that's... <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Um, so that's sort of the, the idea. And that's what I've got. So why don't I open it up to questions? <laughs> results for closed surfaces and results for pairs of pants, but you've, you've stated a bunch of theorems for pairs of pants, so what kinds of results can you use that to, to get on closed surfaces? Okay, so here's the, here's the thing. Okay, so, so two things. The method with the pairs of pants, you have to refine it, and it gets like, gets super technical. Right, and but roughly you get something like L to the K to the three fourths, like up or down on growth. And the reason for this is roughly the following. And this this is like the this is sort of the, like the main idea is you're looking at your geodesic gamma and you somehow want to assign it some set of curves, alpha one through alpha n so that this map is one to one. So you can somehow reconstruct gamma. And so that, you know, the intersection number and length of gamma is reflected in these curves. So something like I of alpha I alpha J, if you sum all the intersections of these guys, is somehow bounded above the optic constant by I of gamma gamma. And then the same thing for like, the sum of the lengths of these alpha I's is somehow bounded above you know, maybe up to a constant by the length of gamma, right? So I have gamma gamma as a self-intersection number? Yes, this is a self-intersection number. This is parallelized intersection number through, like, simple curves or whoever we happen to use to, to get gamma, right? So in that example, this would be a set of simple closed multi-curves, so pair of present pants, right? And so then you want to say, okay, if the intersection number of gamma is at most k and length is at most l, you know, what, you know, 
what, a, what sequences here do we get? Right? So the way to do this is you, you know, we know how to bound the number of each of these of length of cells separately. Right? Each of these is like polynomial and L. Right? And then we want to bound the length of the sequence and we're done. Right? So if each of these represents a pair of pants, we have to count on the pair of pants as well. Right? But somehow the sort of the coarse behavior is determined by like, some sequence, some closed curves, some multi curves, count each one, and then you want to bound them. Okay. So we want to bound the number of these uh, alpha 1 through alpha n that can appear with the most case alpha intersections. And then there's one more thing that you use. If the same, let's say, simple closed curve appears twice, you get that same picture as for pairs of pants where you want to say that they're going to interfere with one another. Right? And if any two of the same guy interfere, that means that the number of, let's say, alpha i equals some fixed alpha is going to be at most square root of k. Right? Because you get quadratic uh, numbers of intersections for like linear growth and the number of the same guy. Okay, so we use this, and we use this. Unfortunately, you don't get the square root of k, you get that the number, you get like n, that length of the sequence, is going to be at most k to the 3 fourths. So, yeah, so on a general surface, <coughs> you expect like constant L, constant k to the 3 fourths. And you have lower bounds? Or? Um, well, okay, there's an obvious lower bound of just thinking of a pair of pants. Right. Right? So, I don't know that you can get better than that because the way you get lower bounds is you sort of get to construct these curves. Right? So on a pair of pants, it's simple. You just have to choose, you know, you, um, you want to choose a correct sequence of boundary edges. Right? And so, but you want to make sure that when you choose the sequence, you don't get something that squishes down to a point, right? If you have, you know, we have like, one of these hexagons, right? We, we want to make sure we don't like accidentally just go around the boundary of this thing, right? So there's like some, there's actually a graph that generates all, that generates like a nice big sequence of uh, of distinct closed geodesics that you know generates good sequences of these boundary edges. So you can do this, you know, quite simply for a pair of pens because there's just three possible letters really that you're playing with. Um, for uh, Closed surface, you have to somehow find sequences of distinct pairs of pants, right? And you have to make sure that like two different sequences will give you two different. Yeah, it's, it's much more complicated. So I haven't, I haven't really worked on that. More questions? Okay. Um, what I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so there's other topological invariants you associate to a curve besides the self intersection number. Okay. Like the gene, you know, you could look at the smallest genus surface that it builds, um, right. um, look at the homology class. Mm -hmm. like, do you know anything about like counting <coughs> number of geodesics that fill the surface of genus K or that are in some particular homology class? Or? Um, well, so, yeah, I don't know anything about homology classes. If you fill a smaller surface, I mean, you'd expect fewer, but since you get the sort of exponential bound, it doesn't really see that, right? So the um, the dependence on the topology of your surface, right? So in some sense, you're counting on a smaller surface, and then maybe like you know looking at various ways to put that smaller surface into your bigger one. So the topology of your surface appears in these constants, and it grows. It's actually not very good growth in the constants. Um, so, yeah, you can't really say too much.